Hello, I'm Dr. Vinita and this is Dr. Naina. And today I'm here to teach you about the examination of the seventh cranial nerve or the facial nerve. Facial nerve is a mixed nerve. It's got both the sensory part and the motor part. Motor part in the sense it is responsible for the innervation of the muscles in the facial expression and also for the stapedius. Sensory part is it innervates the T sensation in the anterior two-third of the tongue and the external auditory canal. Now we start off with the examination proper of the facial nerve. Now before we start off with the examination, we should always ask for the consent of the subject and also give the valid instructions as to what we are going to do to them. Okay, so let's start off with the first test that we are going to do. So may I start off? Yes. So first thing is the person is asked to look up without moving the head. Okay, so uh, please look up without moving the head look up without moving the head. So this would test the frontal belly of occipital frontalis and you can see that there is wrinkling and it is bilateral and symmetrical on both the sides. Okay, that would mean that there is normalcy in the facial nerve there. In case there is a paralysis or some lesion in the facial nerve, there would be asymmetry and there would be no wrinkling on that particular side of the lesion. So that was the first test to examine the facial nerve. Coming to the second test. Second test, we will ask the person to close the eyes firmly and the examiner would try to open the eyes. So with normal effort, an examiner cannot, the, cannot open the eyes of the subject. Okay. So let's see. Please close the eyes firmly and then we will try to open the eyes, which is not possible with normal effort. So this is to test the orbicularis oculi muscle. So here, since the person is able to firmly close the eyes and keep it closed in spite of my effort, that means facial nerve is working normally. So in case there is a paralysis of the orbicularis oculi muscle, the person cannot close the eyes properly. And we can see the eyeballs rolling upwards. So this upward rolling of the eyeball is called as the Bell's phenomenon. This normally occurs in individuals, but since the eyelids would close the eyeballs, we are not able to look at the eyeballs rolling up. So that was about the second test to examine the facial nerve. Coming to the third nerve, third, third uh, test to perform the uh, facial nerve examination, we will look at the nasolabial fold. So that is this fold. So we will look at the nasolabial fold and we can see that it is symmetrical on both the sides. There is no flattening on either sides. So in case the facial nerve is affected, there would be flattening of the nasolabial fold. Okay. Coming to the fourth test, we will ask the subject to smile or show the upper dentition. So can you please smile? So you can see that there is no deviation of the angle of mouth on either side. So in case the facial nerve is affected, there would be deviation of the angle of mouth towards the healthier side. That is the paralyzed side would stay stationary while the angle of the mouth on the healthier side would be deviated. That is because of the unopposed action of the contracting muscles on the healthier side. So that was about the fourth test in the facial nerve examination. Moving on to the fifth test for the facial nerve examination, we will ask the subject to whistle. So can you please whistle? So that determines that the muscle orbicularis oris is functioning normally. Coming to the next test, we will ask the subject to inflate the mouth and keep it inflated. And the examiner would press the cheek to see whether the person can contain the air within the mouth and whether there is any air escape from the mouth. So can you please inflate the mouth? Okay, so please keep it inflated while I press the cheek to see if there is any air leak. So we can see that there is no air leaking from either sides of the mouth. So in case there is paralysis of facial nerve lesion, there will be leaking of air from the mouth. So that was about the next test. Coming to the next test or the seventh test, we are testing for the taste sensation of the anterior two-third of the tongue. For this, we need two strong solutions of sugar and salt and a dropper. Here we will ask the subject to protrude the tongue and we will place solutions of either sugar or salt on the protruded tongue and we will ask the person to keep it protruded. When the person senses the taste, the person is supposed to show by the fingers. If it is a sugar solution, the person is, show, is supposed to show one finger and if it is a salt solution, the person is supposed to show the second finger, two fingers, two fingers together. So let's do that. Yeah. yeah. So I am taking one of the solution and putting few drops on the anterior two-third of the tongue. Okay, so which one? Yes, that was right. So that was a sugar solution. So why was the tongue kept protruded and not taken in? If the protruded tongue is taken in, 
then this solution gets mixed up with the receptors on the palate and the sensations are carried by the other nerves and not by the facial nerve. So to take the uh, examination of purely the facial nerve, we ask the person to keep the tongue protruded and we will place the solutions on the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Coming to the last test, we are asking about the history of hyperacusis. Hyperacusis is nothing but normal sound being perceived at a higher volume. So we will ask the person, can you listen to the ticking of the watches or uh, cutting of the vegetables at a louder noise? No. No. So there is no history of hyperacusis. So that completes the eight tests done for the facial nerve examination. So now we have completed with the examination of facial nerve. It was basically divided into sensory and motor tests. Seven of them were motor tests and sensory was only to test the taste sensation of the anterior two-third of the tongue. Now, before we move on to know about the abnormalities of the facial nerve, let's see the basic tracing of the facial nerve. Now, this is the cerebral cortex, this is the facial nerve nucleus and this is how it is innervating the face. Now, we can say that the upper part of the nucleus has bilateral representation, that is bilateral innervation from both the cortex and this is innervating the upper part of the face. So, the upper part of the face has bilateral representation. Okay, while the lower half of the nucleus gets its innervation only from the opposite side of the cortex which innervates one side of the face, that is the same side of the face. Okay, so when we come across the abnormalities of the facial nerve, we divide it into upper motor neuron lesion that is above the facial nucleus and lower motor neuron lesion that is below the facial nerve nucleus. So imagine there is a lesion here that is the upper motor neuron lesion. So how is the person going to present with us? Since uh, the upper part of the face has bilateral innervation that is it is getting innervated from the other cerebral cortex as well, the upper part of the face or the forehead is being spared in upper motor neuron lesion and only the opposite side lower half of the face will be affected. So that is about the upper motor neuron lesion. But what happens if there is a lower motor neuron lesion that is below the facial nerve nucleus? The half of the face is being innervated from the facial nerve nucleus. So if there is a lower motor neuron lesion, the same side one half that is both upper and the lower part of one half of the, of the face is affected. So this is how we divide between the upper motor neuron lesion and the lower motor neuron lesion. The Bell's palsy is a type of lower motor neuron lesion usually seen if there is an edema of the facial nerve in the facial canal or autoimmune diseases etc. So that completes the facial nerve examination.